Now this next section, 2.3, should be a lot of review from graphing lines and I guess um, obtaining different um, information about a line based on its equation or based on its graph. So I think, yeah, a lot of this should be new, but then toward the end they'll probably be, um, oh did I say new? Sorry. <laughs> a lot of this will probably be review, but um, toward the end there should be some new material still related to lines, but maybe a real life application or two. So okay, this section is titled Linear Functions and Slope. So what are they talking about here? They said, they're asking, is there a relationship between literacy and child mor mortality? As the percentage of adult females who are literate increases, so does the mortality of children under, oh, does the, does the mortality of children under age five decrease? What? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah. Okay, the data from the United Nations indicates that this is indeed the case. Uh, this section of the textbook, you'll be given a graph for which each point represents a country. Okay. You will use the concept of slope to see how much the mortality rate decreases for each 1% increase in the literacy rate of adult females in the country. Okay, so basically, the more moms know, I guess, or the more they read, the more likely they are to keep their babies from dying, or kids from dying, I guess. That's kind of interesting. So anyway, that's kind of heavy though, huh? That's a... That's quite a topic. Um, but let's see, that, let's, starting off though, we won't start off with <laughs> heavy things like that. We'll just start with calculating slope. So this this is kind of a little review. You should have seen the for, formula for slope before. So if you're given two points and you want to find the slope of the line between them, then this formula should be used. So it's and if you've seen this before, you might not need to label, but it kind of helps. The first point they give you, you could, should call x1, y1. So 4 would be x1, um, negative 2 should be y1. And then the second point, almost the same thing, but with the x2 and a y2. So negative 1 and 5 would be x2 and y2, respectively. All right, and then we'll just fill them in this formula here. m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So let's see, we'll fill those in. We've got, what did they say y2 was? It was 5 y1 was the y value of the original point, or the first point given, negative 2. So you got to be careful because there was a subtraction sign from the formula, but 2 is negative, so it's like there's a subtraction sign and a negative next to it. And then the denominator has an x2, which we said was negative 1, and x1 was 4. All right, so as long as you fill everything in correctly, you should be, you should get the right answer. Just be a little careful. So in the numerator, it looks like it's going to be a 7, and the denominator is going to be a negative 5. And that's a fine answer, but as you've probably seen before, if you see a fraction um, where there's a negative on either the numerator and denominator, usually we just kind of throw it on the side. But, of course, if you left it in the denominator, it's correct. You're just probably more likely to see it on the side if, if you were to check your answer in the back of the book or or compare it to the, um, another student, maybe. Okay, so this looks like they want us to do that again. But they don't have the formula next to us, so we have to, we have to rewrite it. Um, why two? So it's like... It's the difference between the y's and the numerator, and then the difference between the x's and the denominator. And if you forget which one's which, sometimes like you know, I might say, oh, well, I forget, is the x in the numerator or the y in the numerator? Which one? Just remember, you probably remember from previous um, cl classes that slope is rise over run, and rise is a vertical change, run is a horizontal change. So if you remember it that way, rise is the y-axis, it's up and down, and x is the, um, or sorry, run is the x-axis. That kind of helps me remember which one's which, which one's on top, which one's on bottom. So, okay, let's see. I'm going to label these guys again. And you don't have to label them, like on an exam or something. I wouldn't, of course, mark you down. It's just, it just kind of helps. All right, I think now we're ready to fill in what we know. So we'll say it's, y okay, y2 comes first. That was 2 minus y1 is 1 over x2, which is 2 minus x1, which is negative 2. Alright, and then we'll, our job is just to simplify that as much as we can. The numerator is a 1, the d denominator is a 4. That's a perfectly fine slope, it's not negative, it's positive. Okay, and if you kind of remember, I don't know if this might be helpful in this section, but remember, like in part A here, the slope was negative, which means that your line will slope to the left, so it'll kind of if you look at it from left to right, it'll be going downward. It'll, it'll be decreasing. Whereas, like in part B, there's a, a positive slope, which is a fourth. 
that one it'll be um, sloping to the right, so it'll be going upward from um, left to right. So that might help us uh, later. Let's see, and then the next objective is, now that we're given, let's see, a point, so kind of similar to what we had before, but now they tell us the slope, and what they want, though, is the equation of the line. Da 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 da, yeah. So that in, in that case, you're going to want to use the point-slope formula here. Point. Slope. Oh yeah, it already says that here. Hello. Point-slope formula. Okay. So, I guess, if you've never seen this before, or if it's been a while, this formula, what you fill in is the M, of course. M is the slope, so let's see, I'm, I'll kind of label that, if that helps. M is the slope. And then the point that you're given, you're going to fill it in for the x1 and the y1. So that's, you know, whatever you're given for x for the x value is going to go there. Whatever you're given for the y value is going to go there. But you're not going to replace the regular y and the regular x. So keep that in mind, because you in, in the end you want an equation, and an equation should have an x and a y. X or Y. Yeah. Only X1 and Y1. Y1. Okay, so hopefully that helps. If, I mean, if you already knew that, sorry. That's kind of boring, but... Alright, let's see. So I'm just gonna... First, I'm just gonna fill them in. I have... Well, Y I'm not supposed to fill in, but Y1 I am. I'll leave that empty. M is supposed to be filled in, so I'll leave that empty. And then X minus X1 is also supposed to be filled in. So we've got, let's see, slope, they said 6. I'll, re I'll replace that where M was supposed to be, here. And then the point, let's see, maybe I'll use a different color here. The X value is 2, and the X value, X1, was supposed to go here. The Y value, negative 5, is supposed to go here, because that's where Y1 was in the formula. There's another subtraction sign next to a negative, just got to be a little careful. That really makes a plus if you want to simplify that. And then I think the idea now is you want to simplify this and distribute the 6 in. So I'll, I'll have 6x minus 12. And, you know, that's that's perfectly fine, but it doesn't look as simple as it could because I could get some like terms together. Like if I move this 5 over, usually you want y by itself in the end the, of these problems. So it's like y is by itself, it's equal to 6x, and then those two constant numbers together make negative 17. So I think that's a good answer. That's that's the equation of a line, and you could graph that if you wanted to. Y intercepts negative 17, you know, and then you use the slope 6. Alright, let's try to do that one more time, but this time we have a, a fraction for a, for slope, so that's that's gonna make it a little more challenging. But at least now we have the idea. It should make it a little easier. X minus X1. Alright, and you could you know you could either label the slope and the point given in your head, or you can actually explicitly write it out so you don't forget. There's X1 and Y1 and there's M. Looks like y1 is negative 3, m is negative 4 thirds, and then x1 is negative 2. But otherwise, I'm going to rewrite the the um, little formula the same. The y stays the same, minus, and then the, the y1 I was given equals m times parentheses x minus x1, which I was given. Okay, now it's just time to kind of clean that up and make it look as nice as possible. The two negatives, or the subtraction sign and the negative, make a positive. And then we have... Um, I might distribute the negative four-thirds in a second. I'm going to write this as a plus, because it's a, a subtracting a negative. So we have that going on. That looks good. Um, yeah, and then I know I need to bring that three over to the other side to get y by itself, but I might deal with this negative four-thirds first. I'm going to distribute it, because I think that's not going to be as easy as it, as it was in the last problem. So, okay, what do we have? y plus three equals, well, negative four-thirds times x would just be negative four-thirds x. But then when I multiply it by 2, first of all, it's a negative times a positive, so it should be a negative. And to multiply it, of course, I should kind of think of the 2 as over 1, and then multiply across. The 4 times the 2 makes 8, and 3 times the 1 makes 3. Alright, so that was that was not too painful, I guess. But then now I want to bring everything together so that y is by itself on one side. If I subtract the 3 to the other side, then the negative 8 thirds and the negative 3 are like terms. But they don't have a common denominator, so I'm going to have to get get one really quick. If I write this 3 as 3 over 1, then I can multiply it by 3 over 3 to get a common denominator. Let's see here. And I think we're pretty much done once we do that. Then we'll have, okay, the, the minus 8 thirds, and now we have minus 9 thirds. So those can combine. What do we have? y equals 
the negative 4 thirds x, which was already there. But now those two constant terms can get together and become negative 17 thirds. So not, not the prettiest equation I've ever seen in my life, but hey, I guess not the worst. There's probably worse out there. That would not be pretty to graph. Yeah, and if, I don't know if you've ever seen one like that and you've been asked to graph it. Probably what you'd want to do is make this either a decimal or um, a mixed number. You know, think of 3 goes into 17 how many times? Let's see, 5 times with 2 left over. Is that right? Yeah. So something like that. That's probably where you would start on the um, the y-axis for your, your y-intercept. Because this is hard to think. Where is 17 thirds on the y-axis? I don't know. But if I think of it as either a mixed number or a, or a decimal number, that would be a lot easier. Alright, now, what does this problem say? A line passes through the points, negative 2, negative 1, so I think I'm probably going to have to call that x1, y1. And then there's another point, so I'll call that x2, y2. Find the equation of the line in point-slope form, um, and then solve the equation for y. And they're nice enough to give us a hint. First, I have to find the slope. So I guess this is probably the hardest, well, the most difficult type of problem as far as them asking you to find the equation of a line. Because, like, yeah, they're not like in the last problem where they gave you the slope. Now you have to find the slope. Once I find the slope, then I'm going to use the point-slope formula. So it's almost like two problems in one. Which is kind of mean of them, but oh well. Um, Alright, so let's fill in the information we're given first into the slope formula. y2 we labeled to be negative 6. y1 was negative 1. x2 was negative 1 also x1 was negative 2. Alright, what well, does that simplify? That would be negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5. Negative 1 plus 2 is 1. Well, at least that become a, a nice number, because negative 5 over 1 is just negative 5. Well, there it is. There's our slope anyway. So I know what goes here for m in the point-slope formula. And then this is where I think everybody gets confused, because there's only one point to fill in here in the point-slope formula. But you're given two points to begin with. So you're actually free to use whichever point you want. I always use, I just usually pick the first one just to make it simple on myself so I don't forget. Um, but you could actually use either one and you should get the same equation either way. But like we said, okay, we'll fill in m equals negative 5 and then, like I said, you could use either point. But just so I don't have to think too hard, I just always grab the first one. That guy. So that'll be my x1, y1. Alright, let's see. y minus and then y1 I'll fill in m times x minus, and x1 I'll fill in. So okay, what was y1? That was negative 1. And then the slope m was negative 5, x1 was negative 2. Alright, there we go. Now we just need to clean this up and we're all done with this problem. So if y plus 1 equals... And then I might be careful, I'm not going to distribute yet, I'm going to simplify this to x plus 2, just, just so I don't mess something up. Um, so we have y plus 1 equals, that'll, now I can distribute it, it'll be negative 5x minus 10. That looks good. And then my very last step is just to isolate y, because it's, you know, that's what, they always want y by itself on, when you have the, an equation of a line. Alright, that'll give me y equals negative 5x minus 11. Alright, so if, I mean, I guess, if you wanted to check your answer, you could graph that line, I think, which we'll kind of review in a second, but... Graph that line by plotting a y-intercept of negative 11 and then using a slope of negative 5. That line, as long as you know you drew it pretty precisely, it should pass through both of these points that were given to begin with. Negative 2, negative 1, and then also negative 1, negative 6. I guess that's kind of a way to check your answer. Uh, let's, and then they have another problem where they want us to do the exact same thing, just for practice, you know, to really get the hang of it. Um, so I'll, I'll do the same thing. Label this guy x1, y1, and this guy x2, y2. And then first we'll fill it into the slope formula. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Alright, we have, what was y2? 4. And then y1 was negative 1. x2 was 2. x1 was negative 3. Looks like a 5 over 5, huh? Positive 5 over positive 5, which makes positive 1. That's almost the nicest slope you could possibly ask for. That's nice. Alright, so we got slope. There he is. And then I guess, I'll, like we did before, I'll just grab the first point and use that in the point-slope formula. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. There we go. I'm sorry if you kind of hear... I think I've heard a student before said, 
It sounds like there's a vacuum cleaner going on in the background of the video, but it's this, this computer, the one the school gave me, it's kind of, it's got, I guess it gets hot when I make a video. I don't know, it has to use a lot of power or something, but um, then the, what's it called? The little fan comes on, it's trying to cool itself. So sorry if that's bothering you, but ugh, it seems like every time I make a video, it has to do that. Oh, well. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't bother you too much. Okay, let's fill things in. M was 1, we just found that. And then X1 and Y1 were the values from the first point. Negative 3 was the X value. And negative 1 was the Y value. But, like I said, if you like the second point better because it was positive numbers, then feel free to use that, of course, because they should give you the same equation in the end. Once you're done, it should look exactly the same. So I'll simplify the left side, that's Y plus 1. And then the right side, I guess, you know, if you want, you can just get rid of the 1, because I know, oops... I know when I distribute the 1, it's not, you know, nothing's really going to change. There'll be, I mean, you can think of it as 1 times x, which is x, 1 times 3, which is 3. And then last step would be move the 1 over so that y is all by himself. Alright, so we're left with y equals x plus 2. That's almost the nicest equation, or nice, nicest problem like that I've ever seen, mostly because the slope was 1. That was pretty nice. Alright, hopefully this is a little bit of review. Um, but the next objective is to kind of talk about the graph of a line. So our objective here is to write the graph, or sorry, write and graph the slope-intercept form of the equation of a line. So it looks like in this first example here, they give us both. I think it's just kind of, just trying to get us ready for doing one on our own. So here's, here's the function, and it looks weird because there's a f of x, but remember you're always, you're always feed, free to um, replace f of x with y, so if, you, if it makes you feel more comfortable Replace f of x with y, but then, of course, everything else should stay the same. So, okay, this means that 1 is the y-intercept. So that's where you would start when you graph this line. That should be the point 0, comma, whatever that value is there, 1 in this case. So we'll start there, and they have already put a point there, 0, 1. And then I'll use the slope, let's see, slope is 3 fifths. So from the point I just plotted, I'm supposed to rise 3 and run 5. And since they're both positive numbers, I'm going to go in the positive direction. Rising would be upward, because that's the positive direction on the y-axis. And then running the positive direction, that's either left or right, but the right, you know, to the right is the positive direction on the x-axis. If the 5 was negative, I would go to the left, because that's the negative direction. But okay, so from there, I'm supposed to rise 3, let's see, up 3, 1, 2, 3, and then run 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's their second point right there. And then once you have two points, of course, for a line, you can just connect them, and that'll be your your um, graph. So, like, yeah, like I said, it, they've already done it for us, but it was just kind of practice. But now we're left to our own devices here. Y equals, now we're given 3 fourths x minus 2. So we're supposed to start with the y-intercept, negative 2. Let's see. Negative 2 would be down 2. On the, and then, again, it's the y-intercept, so it should always be on the y-axis. Put a point there. And then the slope is 3 fourths. So I should rise 3 and run 4. And again, those are both positive numbers, so I should go up and to the right. Those are the positive directions on the, the y-axis and the x-axis, respectively. So okay, from that point I just drew, I'll go up 3. 1, 2, 3 will bring me just above the x-axis, and then to the right 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're just about there. And that should be my line, as long as, as long as I'm careful it should look about right. Sometimes when you're just kind of freehanding it, it doesn't look that straight, but, you know, you get the idea. And I'll, I get the idea when you graph it, too. It doesn't have to be perfect. Alright, so this, this next objective is to graph horizontal and vertical lines. This is probably something, one of the easiest things to forget. So the first equation is just y equals 3, which it doesn't even, to me, it doesn't even look like an equation of a line, right? You think, it's supposed to look like y equals mx plus b, but there isn't even an x in this equation. But equations of this form, when there's an x missing and there's only a y... They're going to be horizontal lines. Um, yeah, only a y variable. That's a horizontal line. So once you, once you kind of remember that, it's, it's hard to remember that, but once you remember that, then it's pretty simple. You just draw a horizontal line through this value, 3. So if it was y equals negative 5, I'd draw a horizontal line through negative 5. But in this case, it's through 3, so I'll go ahead and try to draw, you know, as straight as I can, a horizontal line through 3 on the y-axis. And that's it. So, you know, graphing these aren't, it's not really hard. It's just the hard thing is to remember 
is it a vertical line? Is it a horizontal line? What's going on? All right, so this next one's similar because it's y equals. There's an x missing. So it's still a horizontal line, um, but now it's through negative 2. So I just find negative 2 on the y-axis and draw a horizontal line through it. So it's not the mo These are definitely aren't the most exciting problems or most uh, thought-provoking or interesting. All right, but now we're given one where there's an x and no y. So this, this type with um, only an x-coordinate, no y-coordinate, those are just the opposite. Those are vertical lines. Vertical lines. And it's the same thing, except now you're looking for where's this value, but on this axis. Instead of the y-axis, I'll look at the x-axis. Where's negative 3? Here he is. Go draw a vertical line through that. You know, that does not look like a straight line, but, you know, you can use your imagination. And we'll do the same thing with this one, because it looks like it only has an x-coordinate, no y-coordinate. But now I find 5 on the x-axis and draw a vertical line through that guy. Yeah, not too crazy. It's just, like I said, it's hard to remember what kind of a line it is when there's an x missing or when there's a y missing. All right, and so now our objective is we want to be able to recognize and use the general form of a line's equation. All right, so they, they call it a, the general form of a line when y is not by itself. Because when, you know, when it looks like y equals mx plus b, that's the point, or the, what do they call it, slope-intercept form, because the slope's sitting there in front of you and so is the intercept. But if you're given if you're given um, the equation of a line in any any other kind of form like this, the general form, just pretty much that means everything is on one side of the equation. Then if, they, if you want to know information about it, you're going to have to get it in the form y equals mx plus b, which just means you're going to try to get y by itself. Because then, like like we said before, our um, our slope and our y intercept are kind of just sitting there staring you in the face. So I'll take this guy, and then you know it depends how you want to do it. But I think if I'm trying to get y by itself. I can move all the other terms to the other side at the same time if I want to. I'm going to subtract the 3x, that'll get rid of him, and add the 12, that'll get rid of him. And now they're both on the other side. So 6y is now all by himself on the left. Negative 3x plus 12 is on the right. And now y is not quite by itself, I still have to divide by 6. And I think what I would do is instead of dividing the entire right side by 6, I just divide each individual term by 6. Because so that'll just make it easier to simplify. Like we've done, you know, this term gets its own 6, this term gets its own 6. And this fraction reduces, the 3 goes into 6 twice, so it looks like a half. And then there's an x attached, plus, and 12 over 6 just becomes a whole number, because 6 divides in evenly. And I think, what, did they want us to recognize this? Yeah, the slope and the y-intercept, okay. So, I mean, at this point, we should know how to do that, because a couple problems back, we had to take one of these guys and graph it. So we know that this guy's the y-intercept, Intercept. I mean, but technically a y-intercept should be a point. It should always look like t 0, comma, whatever the value is, so 2 in this case. And then the slope is the coefficient of x. Just don't forget when you write the slope to write the negative as well, if there is a negative. So there it is, yeah. So just a little extra work, I guess, to try to get um, y by itself. I want us to try it again, just to get some good practice. So I'll pretty much do the same thing. I'm going to move the, the x term over. In this case, I'll subtract 5x. And also the constant term that does not have a y attached, I'm going to subtract that over to the other side. Let's see, okay. That would leave me negative 7y all by itself on the left side, and then negative 5x minus 14 on the right side. And then the only thing left to do is divide every term by the coefficient of y, negative 7, to really get y by itself. Alright, that'll leave y by itself. That looks good. And then notice here, there's a negative divided by a negative. That'll make a positive. And 5 and 7 don't reduce, so I'll just have to leave it that way. X. But here it's negative 14 divided by negative 7. That's actually positive 2. That's, that's at least some kind of satisfaction. I kind of like seeing at least one fraction become a whole number. That's nice. Looks like our y-intercept's exactly the same as the last one, huh? 0, 2, because that's the value there. And the slope is the coefficient of x, so 5 sevenths. This time a positive slope, last time was negative. There, I think that looks good. Alright, now they want us to... Oh, okay, this is just a different method on how to graph lines. So they want us to use intercepts to graph um, a line or a linear function in standard form. So this this is... this Right now we're just going to do it just to... You know, because they told us to. But later on this will be optional. You don't have to graph a line any... You know, any specific way. You can graph it however you want. This is just an option. So you always have the option, if you want, to isolate y. Like if I took this guy, 
and did what we just did in the previous problems, get y by itself, I could just use the slope and y-intercept. But I think they want to remind us that you don't really have to do that if you want to do this alternate method. You can also find the intercepts instead. So it's, you don't have to make a table, but it kind of helps me. What you're going to do is you're going to plug in 0 for one variable. See what, see what, like, so for example, I'll plug in 0 for y. I'll see what happens to x. And then I'll plug in 0 for x and see what happens to y. And then I guess, yeah, the, the idea is that 0 is a really nice number. So you don't, it's not going to be a lot of work, you know. Let's see, if I want to find out what happens here, y equals 0, I'm plugging that in. 3x minus 2 times 0 minus 6 equals 0. And then you're just trying to solve it after that. So the middle term's just gone because it's 0. 3x minus 6 equals 0. And now my job is to get x by itself, try to figure out what he is. So add the 6 over, and then divide by 3, and that should do it. x is 2. All right, there we go. X is 2. So that's, there's one point we have. 2 comma 0. If I want, I can plot that right now. And then we'll do the same thing to the other value, but now, oops, now we're plugging in 0 to X and see what happens. Let's see, it's 3 times X, but I want 0 minus 2Y, oops, minus 6 equals 0. Kind of running out of room here. And then that first term, like we said, disappears because it's 0. You're just left with negative 2Y minus 6 equals 0. Now my job is to solve that, and that'll whatever I get as a value, that'll go here. And I'll know my second point. So I'm going to add 6 over to the other side. Let's see, that'll give me a positive 6 on the right. But then when I divide by negative 2 on both sides, I'll be left with a negative 3 for y. So looks like there's my second point, negative, or 0 comma negative 3. That'll be down here. There we go, and that should be it. I'll connect those guys. There's my line, and that should be the same line as if you were to, in the beginning, take this equation and solve it for y. And, you know, use the slope and y-intercept. And, you know, honestly, just that was just kind of review um, this example we did. But the next time, I think we could do it faster. This is just an alternate method, so, you know, keep that in mind. You don't have to do it this way. I'm never going to force you to do it this way. Just so you know that you don't have to solve for y if you don't want to. All right, so this, I think this one we could maybe do in our heads, now that we kind of have the idea. I'm going to do the same thing, and you don't have to make a table if you don't want. You can kind of do it in your head. If you can keep track of numbers in your head better than I can, then feel free not to use a table. But so that now, what I'm going to do is plug in 0 for y, because that's the first point that I'm trying to find. So imagine there's a 0 here next to the 3. Well, then that would mean that 3y is gone, and you know, you're just left with 4x minus 5 equals 0. And if you're pretty good at doing mental math, you can solve that in your head. So imagine I add the 5 to the other side. That'll make it positive 5, and then I'll divide by 4. Then I'll give an answer of 5 fourths. So I didn't really need to write anything out. You know, I could um, just kind of picture it in my head. Okay, so now, the next point, I'm going to forget all that, because now we're plugging in 0 for x. So now we're trying to find this point. Now this guy, there's going to be a 0 next to the 4, which means that term just disappears altogether. And that means that we're left with just 3y minus 5 equals 0. And that, I feel like, again, you can solve in your head. If I add 5 to the other side, that'll become positive, And then divide by 3, I'll have 5 thirds as my answer. And then I'll just go ahead and plot those points. 5 fourths, you know, that's a little over 1. That's 1 and a quarter. Let's see, where's that on the x-axis? 1 and a quarter is about here, maybe. Oh, I made it too big, but whatever. And then 5 thirds, let's see, divide 3 into 5. 3 goes into 5 once with two left over. So that's like one and two thirds, and that's on the y-axis, so that'll be about here maybe. And then I'll connect those guys. There we go. So really, that didn't really take that long. Like I said, if you do the math in your head, because that's, that's kind of the beauty of it. If I plug in zero for a variable, it kind of makes things, well, makes things disappear, and then you could probably figure out what happens with the second variable in your head, if that makes sense, hopefully. But again, that's just an, just an alternate method, just to see if you'd rather do that instead. It's up to you. You never have to do it that way. We're not going to force you to. Looks like, okay, I think we're on the last type of problem. So I think that was all review, pretty much. Now we're kind of, this this might be review too, it's just an application of linear equations. That's where, okay, they give you, they give you kind of a set of, a set of data about some situation, and they want you to come up with a linear equation or a line that kind of models the data. So that's that's a kind of a real life situation. I like that. Um, so let's read what's going on here in this first problem. Uh, let's see. It says the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere 
uh, measured in parts per million, has been increasing as a result of the burning of oil and coal. All right. So I mean, a lot of this, a lot of what they give you in these problems is just lead up to the math. So you can kind of browse through it if you care, but then we're really wanting to get the numbers here. Uh, the buildup of gases and particles is believed to trap heat and raise the planet's temperature. When the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide is 317 parts per million, the average global temperature is 57.04 Fahrenheit. When the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide is 354 parts per million, the average global temperature is blah, 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 blah. Okay. So I think the idea here is they've given us kind of, I don't know, I guess two types of numbers. First, they're giving us how many parts per million. You know, in one situation, here's the parts per million. I guess I can think of that as like the X values or something. And here's another X value later because they said um, there's another diff another number of parts per million. So if I want, I can call one of them x1, the other one x2. I just call them both x because they represent the same quantity. You know, they're both the parts per million. Um, and then they give us another type of number. What is it? Um, the temperature. We can call that y, I guess. And since there's two different temperatures given, I'll call this guy y1 and this guy y2. So I guess x1 and y1 are associated. It says, when this is how many parts per million, then this is the temperature. That's why they're both ones, you know, an x1 and a y1. And similarly here, the parts per million and the carb and the temperature should be associated with each other. Okay, and then this one, they're kind of going to guide us through it a little bit just to give us a head start. But I think we'll do a problem next where it'll be just us on our own. But it'll be a similar thing. Um, so that, what they ask us to do here is write a linear function that models average global temperature, f of x. Or in other words, remember that's y. So I guess what they're, they've, right there, they've specified what they want y to be. They want y to be the temperature which we've already kind of done up here. So I guess imagine if I had labeled these opposite, if I had let um, the number of parts per million be y and the temperature be x, then I wouldn't know anything's wrong until I get to here when they said f of x should represent temperature. Or in other words, like we said, y should represent temperature. And I should, I should switch what I let x and y represent. So they should probably tell you that or else, yeah, how would you know? So they want y to be a temperature or f of x to be temperature for an atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide of x parts per million. Okay. And that's what we've let x be. x is the number of parts per million. So that's good. I think we've kind of labeled it correctly. So they, yeah, like I said, they're kind of guiding us here. Write the equation of the line through the points. You know, this was our x1. This was our y1. This was our x1, x2, y2. That's how we labeled them above. So it's like it's like going back to, let me see, This might it might help to go back and see which problem is this similar to, where was it? Sorry, let me see, let me see. You know, the ones where we were, we were given two points and they wanted an equation. Damn, dang, that seems like it was really far back. Oh, there we go. So parts, or numbers 2, two C and D. So that's, this is kind of like a crazy, souped up version of part, part problem 2, C and D. Let's see, where are we now? Here we go. So yeah, this is like number 2, part C and D. It's just, instead of them just giving you two points without any context, they give you a context, and you kind of have to sift through all the words and stuff to get the points. But then you're doing the same thing, you know, you find the slope, like it kind of shows here, they found the slope for us, but then they want us to find the equation of the line, so we'll do that. Um, but it looks, it looks like they filled everything in for us, the x1 and the y1, the x2 and the y2, and then they subtracted the y1 and the y2, they got 0.6, they subtracted the x1 and the x2, they got point, or 37, and then, you know, you, a lot of times with a fraction, we keep it as a fraction when we're talking about slope. But in this case, I think that's because this is real life, you kind of want to have decimals as answers. You know, you want approximations because this is real life situation, which is why they, they used a calculator to approximate this. Calculator, you know, on their calculator, they just did what's 0. 0.6 divided by 37. And they probably rounded it, so they got 0. 0.016. M is about 0. 0.016. Okay. But the thing they didn't do it for us was to um, substitute into the point-slope formula. So we'll go ahead and do that because that's what they asked for, the um, the equation of the line. Y, and wh by now we know we don't replace Y, we, we replace Y1. And X we don't replace, we replace X1. And also the slope. So slope was 0 0.0, ah, did I leave enough room? 1, 6. And then Y1 and X1, I'll just go back to those that um, point that we labeled X1, Y1. Y1 was 57.04, and X1 was 317, so I'll fill those in 
in the appropriate places where they're supposed to go. All right, I think we have the equation. We're just going to try to clean it up a little bit. Why? Not much to do on the left yet. I'm going to try to work on the right here. So I'll try to distribute this 0.016. And they're probably not going to get pretty numbers. That's kind of how real life works. When it's a real life situation, you don't get pretty numbers. But 0 0.016 times x would just be that, 0 0.016 times x. But then 0 0.016 times, I guess, negative 317. I'm going to use a calculator to figure that out. Okay, so I got 5.072 when I multiplied 0.016 times 317. And then the very last step would just be to move it, move the um, 57.04 over, because like we saw before, we're supposed to get y by itself. That looks good. Okay. Da, 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 da. So y is all by himself. It's 0.016x. And these two added together should be 51.968 if I did that right. I think that's it, and then I think that's that's a fine answer. It's just I think if you want to be really picky about it, which you know a lot of times math books are, um, it, it wants us to write. Okay, right, ah, I wanted to get the highlighter. Hello, there it is. Write a linear function that models average global temperature f of x. So I think just if you're a little picky, which they might be, they might say, okay, yeah, that's correct, but we wanted y to look like f of x instead, even though we know they mean the same thing. Because they said they asked for a function. They didn't ask for an equation, I guess. So that's the difference. If they ask you for a function, you want to see f of x. Or g of x. Or so something of x. Something that looks like a function. Oh, that's not the prettiest line I've ever seen. Or equation of a line. But hey. Like we said, real life is not pretty usually. It's so, okay. Now that, that we've done it once, let's kind of try it without any training wheels. Because now we'll have... Mm, they won't guide us through it. But that's that's the idea on these ones. Is to get two points... And this should tell you kind of what x should stand for and y should stand for, or f of x. We'll take the two points and we'll use the slope formula. Da -da -da -da. Once we find the slope, then we'll use the point-slope formula to find the equation later on. So y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. All right, that should be good. So let's see, what's this problem about? The life expectancy for men born in 1980 is 70 years. And the life expectancy for men born in 2000 is 74.3 years. Okay, that's pretty good. That's a good direction, right? It's going up. Um, let x represent the number of birth years after 1960. Ooh, okay, i got to think about that. Um, and y is male life expectancy. All right, so the x value, let's see, x1 is the number of years after, uh, what did I say? 1960. Ooh, i got to think about that. Da, 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 da. And same thing with X2, but I think X1, the first year they mentioned was 1980. And so how many years passed? Number of years... I don't know. How, I'm going to phrase this a weird way because I'm not really good with words. That's why I'm a math person, I guess. Um, nine, number of years from 1980... Or I guess number of years 1980... Oh my gosh, I'm having a hard time with this. From 1980 to... 1960, because that's that's the year that they're comparing to. So it looks like X1 should be 20 years. Because they've specified here, let's see, where did they specify? Right here. That X should be the number of years passed since 1960. So they're always wanting us to compare whatever year we're looking at to 1960. So 20 years passed the first time from 1980. And then the second year that they talk about is the year 2000. There are 40 years have passed since 1960. So x2 should be 40, because that's the number of years that passed from the year that they want us to always compare it to, it sounds like, 1960 to the year that we were interested in in that particular time, 2000. So that's already kind of confusing. I just, you know, I'd, I'd really like to just use 1980 and 2000. That'd be kind of nice, but they're very picky here. They don't want x to be a year. They want it to be the number of years that passed since bleh. Okay, and then what else? Da -da 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 -da. Oh. They want y to be the male life expectancy. So in 1980, it was 70.0. So that should be the y value that's associated with the year 1980, which is was here. So this is the year 1980. Just to remind myself, this was the year 2000. Let's see, the life ex expectancy in the year 2000 was what? Oh, here we go. 74.3 years. All right. So I think we got our points. That was a little more difficult and a little more thought. 
had to go into it than in the last problem, but hey, I think we got through it. And now I'll label those guys. That's x1, y1, and this is x2, y2. And I'll fill those in where they're supposed to go in the slope formula. It's okay, let's see. y2 was... Oh, might as well use the same color, huh? So I don't confuse myself. y2 was 74.3. y1 was 70.0. And then x2 was, where was he? 40. And x1 was 20. Alright, if I subtract, I've got 4.3 on the top. And on the bottom, 20. And that that's not a pretty fraction. And like I said, this is a real life situation. So I think you're free to get a decimal out of that. If this was, you know, a problem where they just want you to um, find the equation of a line and there's no context... Usually you want it to be as accurate as possible. You don't want to use a calculator and round or anything like that. You want it to be exact. But because this is a real life situation, we want you know nice decimal answers that are... It's okay if they're approximations. But it looks like 4.3 divided by 20 is exactly 0.215. Let me try that one more time just to be safe. I'm kind of paranoid. Okay, I think that's right. So there's our slope. Now I can substitute that into the point slope formula here. Might as well go ahead and do that before I forget what it is, huh? 0.215. And then we'll substitute the y1 and the x1 for the first point we we had there. But of course, the x and the y are staying the same. What was x1 and y1? Here we go. Let's see, these guys here. x1 and y1. So I'll put those here and here, except they're kind of switching places because... In the point, the x was on the left, the y was on the right, but in the um, in the formula here, the y is on the left, so I'll put 70.0 here, and the x is on the right, 20. So that's that's the equation of our line, it's just now our job is just to clean it up. 70.0, okay, and then I'll multiply this 0.215 in. That times x is just 0.215x, but now I want to multiply that by 20, and that would be 4.3. Alright, now our last, well our last step is just to get y by itself, so I'll move 70 over by adding it. Alright, so y is equal to 0.215x, which is just this term, and then 70 and negative 4.3 should be 65.7, is that right? Yeah, okay. Well there it is, that's the equation, but again they, they would like to see a function. Did they call it f of x? I think they called it f of x. Oh, e of x. See, all right, they're being even pickier. I guess that's... In real life, I think I might want that. I would want to know what this stands for. So e for life expectancy, I guess. That's kind of good. So you just be careful of that, or cognizant, I guess. They're, they might specify that. I don't want it to be f of x. I want it to be e of x for expectancy, or some something that represents what they're talking about. But that's our beautiful linear equation. And I guess, you know, the point of getting this type of thing, a linear equation, is that, okay, I know what happened in 1980. I knew the life expectancy then. I knew what happened in 2000, but maybe I'll try to project what's going to happen in 2020. Right? And they even said that. Use the function to project the life expectancy of American men in 2020. Did they ask for that in the last one? No, huh? Okay. They just wanted the equation in, in the last one, but now they're trying to be tricky. So they want to project... Da, 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 da. Okay. Well, if you remember from the beginning of the problem, they said they want x to be the number of years, let's see, in, because this is now they want in 2020, that year, x is the number of years since um, the year 1960. Since 1960. So from 2020 to 1960, it looks like 60 years have passed, right? So all I really have to do is put a 60 there for x. I'm just going to replace it. If, you, if you're fancy and you want to use function notation, you're going to say e of 60. So if you're plugging 60 in equals, and then you're replacing x with 60. Just to bring the function notation and this linear stuff together. I'm trying to put 60 in there. Okay. And whatever I get from my calculator here is what the answer will be. So let's see, what is that going to be here? All right, I got 78.6, so I guess... And that seems like it's a, along the... What they were saying, you know? That it, what was the life expectancy? See, it was 70, and then it was 74.3. Now it's 78.6. It seems like it's going up by 4.3 years every 20 years. Is that right? Yeah. 
So that sounds about right. Um, life expectancy in what year? 2020. That's pretty good, actually, I think. That's pretty high up there, isn't it? I don't know. But anyway, hopefully that made sense, and hopefully it wasn't too boring if it was a lot of review, or too over your head if you've never seen a lot of this before. But it, it was fun, hopefully. Maybe not fun, but it was uh, doable. Is that asking too much? But if that makes you feel better, the next section should be shorter. I think it's it's kind of a more specific topic, and it should be not too much going on. So, all right, I'll see you then.